Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for, uh, for allowing me to speak to you today about an issue which um, has of late developed quite a, uh, quite a topical relevance because it um, has surfaced both in the Australian and international sporting context. And that is, as you probably gathered from that slide up there, um, buyout clauses in um, professional football player contracts. Um, now, I realise when I say football up here, that's probably referring to a number of different codes. Um, I'm referring to the round ball version, okay, association football, um, or soccer as it's commonly known here. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, um, it's football. Um, now, I've put my first little title slide there, the world game, and I, I use that title and it's used quite often because it quite literally is the world game. Um, it is the most uh, watched and played version of football uh, on the planet. It's also the most valuable by net worth and by player salary, and we're falling, uh, sorry, we're only just ahead of um, a number of other codes such as uh, NBA and baseball and um, NFL, which are, uh, which are also quite lucrative. Um, and I've already covered the fact that it's known as soccer more widely here. Uh, but you'll notice there's an interesting um, linguistic change, um, and that is that's now the Football Federation of Australia, formerly the Australian Soccer Federation, uh, they're moving away from the soccer terminology and um, uh, they're referring more to it as more and more as football. Uh, and I say all this to put it in context, and that is that we are part of a, a major um, industry, and that is sport. It's a global global phenomenon. <laughs> you can see there, um, and that was a, uh, a Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, study, which revealed, or sorry, predicted that global sports revenue this year would tip 177.6 billion. So we're talking about something pretty significant. Um, so I wanted to take an angle from my area of expertise. I'm a commercial lawyer um, and I lecture in these areas as well. Um, well I thought it would be interesting uh, to take this, uh, this perspective of, uh, of, of um, sport in particular, and that is the use of what's known as the buyout clause, and I'll come to this shortly. Um, but it's important, first of all, to know that it's so heavily regulated now. This game is, um, as I said, part of that rich sporting fabric which we have in this country, and I think we're better for it. Um, but it's also extremely well regulated. I say well regulated, but it's heavily regulated in any event. Uh, so contracts are everywhere, um, and that's what sort of attracted me to, uh, to speak about this, because uh, it's received very little attention um, and only a little bit of scholarly attention. And it's something which is quite significant, and as we'll come to see later on, um, there's instances where it's actually impacting on how um, various codes in this country and in others around the world are administered. Um, so I want to look at issues with legality and also um, issues of integrity, which I think one almost follows the other, and you'll come to see this as I get into it. Uh, but I think there's a number of um, uh, legal issues surrounding the use of the buyout clause and also some issues with integrity, which I'll touch on there as well. Um, I hate to do this, and I, hate, I tell my classes this as well, but unfortunately, uh, if you'd understand the rest of my talk, I have to run you through a few contract law basics, so I'm really sorry, A, if you've heard this before, or B, if you haven't. <laughs> um, liquidated damages clause. Uh, this is what, what we're talking about, basically. So it's a clause in a contract which stipulates um, beforehand the, an amount that a party in breach will pay if they do breach the contract. Okay, so, you know, if, um, uh, X party X breaches the contract, they will pay five hundred dollars. Party Y. Pretty simple. Um, it's pretty. It's very useful as well, and the courts constantly say this. You know, it's useful um, because it tells us what the party's rights and liabilities are. We don't have to worry about working it out. There it is in black and white, um, and it also saves a party from suing in general damages, which are speculative. Okay, so the courts determine how much you're entitled to if you bring a, a general civil action. Um, in the case of a liquidated damages clause, there's no need to worry about it. The amount's stipulated, that's that. And it's very important now to distinguish liquidated damages clauses from penalty clauses. All right, now a penalty clause goes a step further. That's, um, a, a penalty clause is not enforceable, okay? In the common law of contract, a penalty clause is not enforceable. Um, so how do you tell the difference? Well, it comes from a wonderful English case, Donald Pneumatic. Basically, it will be a penalty if the amount that you're claiming um, is extravagant and unconscionable, okay, in comparison to the amounts that could conceivably have been incurred by way of damages for breach. So in other words, if you're saying, um, you know, you parked here for uh, 20 minutes longer than you should have and we're charging you $400, it seems a little extravagant and I'm assuming, as the courts probably would, that that is well and beyond what you could possibly incur by way of costs for somebody parking in a park for more than 20 minutes. 
So it has to be, as I've said there, a genuine pre-estimate of loss. That's what we're looking for. Um, and I've put a little list of factors there that you take into account. So the origins of the clause, all right, the type of relationship between the parties. So these are all the things we're looking at, all right, in determining if what we've got here is um, a penalty or a liquidated damages clause. And that finally brings us to buyout clauses. So what is a buyout clause? Well, um, it's a concept which is quite unique to, uh, to sport in particular. Um, it is used in some other contexts, such as uh, corporate buyouts. But what I'm talking about here is um, a clause which stipulates in a football contract, okay, specifically how much the club or the player must pay in the event that there's a unilateral breach. Uh, sorry, unilateral termination. So what am I talking about? Unilateral means it's on the part of one party, okay, so not both. One party has decided to end this agreement um, with, with or without cause. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, that case there that I've mentioned, the first dog point, uh, Punic Yerevan and Rapid Bucharesti, that was a, a decision of the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And they basically said there, look, what we're talking about, buyout clause is a liquidated damages clause, or it's a species of it. Okay, you're basically saying what happens when a party terminates the agreement? Okay, how much do you have to pay? Um, now, I'm speaking in the context of when a player decides to terminate, because invariably, that's that's the situation, okay? It's almost always the player that wants to leave, okay? So they say, oh, had enough, <laughs> that's it, um, I'm terminating. Very, very rare occasions where the club will do so, um, but for example, where there's a significant enough incidence of um, a misdemeanor, okay, or they've uh, behaved inappropriately, used banned substance, whatnot, as happened with Chelsea with the Matter case, you probably remember, Chris. Um, in that instance, yeah, there's, there's um, cause for the club to terminate, but more, than, more often than not, it's the player. So how do these buyout clauses fit into the laws of football? Well, football um, is very well regulated. It's, as I said, the world game, so it's important there's a body to deal with disputes about the world game, and that's FIFA. I'm not even going to attempt to try and pronounce what it stands for, but it's, uh, it's a big, long name. <laughs> but basically, um, it's the Global Football Association, which is responsible for administering the game and the laws um, in conjunction with another body, which is the International Football Board. Um, so they came together most recently to uh, review the rules and there's one set of regulations in particular which is the one I've got up on the screen and that's the regulations for the status and transfer of players. Okay, So these basically are the rules which say what happens when a player wants to shift between clubs and as you probably know this happens a lot in global football. Um, and what we're concerned with is Article 17, and that says what happens when a player decides to unilaterally terminate their contract. Basically, it does stipulate they are obligated to pay a compensation, as you would be if you breached ever, any other contract, all right? so not sport, just any contract, you would have to pay compensation. So that makes that very clear. It says um, you have to pay compensation by reference to these criteria unless you provide otherwise. Okay, so if there's a clause you've included which says you know this player has to spend 50 million um, by reference to this, that's fine. If you don't, by reference to the criteria in Article 17. And then there's this wonderful little document which FIFA produced, and um, we know how wonderful they are at doing this, um, and that's producing voluminous amounts of paperwork. <laughs> but they uh, created another document known as the commentary to the regulations and it's almost an annotated version of the regulations and there's an interesting little comment there um, to article 17 and it basically says and the first bit i think there in gold is the most significant um, it recognizes that these buyout clauses uh, do exist and are used okay so it contemplates the fact that parties will do this even those will come to see they prefer they don't um, but it actually says there, you know, the advantages of this clause are that the player can terminate the agreement without penalty because they've agreed to pay that sum. So that's where the uh, regulatory side of it comes from. This raises some very significant issues though, and speaking solely as a contract lawyer, and again, I find great delight in contract law, I'm sorry if you don't, but <laughs> you'll see that this is actually quite significant because if this was to come before a court of law, um, I would be very, very curious to see what they say, um, particularly about some uh, more high-profile examples, which I'll come to. Now, the courts have said, look, you don't need to be precise, okay? We don't need to say um, how much, for example, a player should pay um, if they decide to terminate one year into a four-year agreement, or it doesn't have to be perfect, all right? But it needs to be a roundabout idea 
of how much that club is going to suffer, okay, monetarily, if a player decides to leave. That's fair enough. This is my question though. How do you quantify, how does a football club quantify the losses that stem from the loss of a player? Because you have to remember, and as we've heard all day, and this is a theme which permeates all of the chats so far that we've had, um, it's such a, it's a magnificent industry, it's huge. So how exactly do we determine this? Some interesting examples that I put there. Um, has anyone heard of Lionel Messi? I would hope so. Even if you don't follow the game, you probably would have seen his, if not the next chaps, Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, now they play for uh, Barcelona and for Real Madrid, respectively, and I'm hoping that you would have heard of them. <laughs> Massive Spanish clubs. They've got some very large buyout clauses in their contracts. Lionel Messi's, 200 million pounds. Ronaldo's, 785 million pounds, which is roughly one billion, billion euro, one and a half billion Australian. That's quite a significant a sum for a human being. What's the issue? Well, what I want to know, and this is what the common law wants to know, is that a genuine pre-estimate of loss? What losses do those sums cover? Okay, now Article 17 says you have to consider a number of factors, and I've listed them there, I won't read them out. Um, but it includes such things as, right, how much time do they have left on their contract? Um, as I said, the fees and expenses that are paid as a result, okay? Um, was it in, I've said protected period there, that means the first, uh, depending on how long they've signed on for, normally the first uh, 12 to 18 months, and, uh, and the remuneration that was due to them, so how much their salary was. But they leave out something very important, and that is the player's market value. What are they worth as a marketable product? And I use that uh, in quite a cynical sense, but unfortunately, um, it's such a heavily commercialized game. The players are essentially products. They're stock for their clubs. So consider things like that. The value of the footballer, okay, just as a player, as a technically gifted athlete, and their marketing worth. Okay, so remember, football, as I said, very heavily commercialized. So we're looking at kit sales. Um, kits is the word, uh, I think it's an anglicized term they use for uh, shirts and shorts and whatnot. Sponsorships, endorsements, okay, so you add all that up, it's quite significant. But even so, 785 million pounds for Ronaldo, 200 million for Messi. I'm not sure I'm convinced. There's a couple of studies that have um, been produced uh, very recently suggesting that um, if you take into account all the um, factors that I mentioned so far, you're not even getting close to half that figure. And that's assuming that Ronaldo is, is as revered, you know, as a religious icon. That's still a fair bit of money, even assuming he's worth half of that, you know. Where do they pull 785 million from? I'm not too sure. Um, but naturally there are problems, you know, with trying to estimate what a player's market value is. And that's because um, if you understand football, uh, the, the nature of the market is such that the value of a player is determined by the movements of that market, okay? What that means is that clubs often assign extravagant sums, okay, to their star players. The reason, and often, as I've said there, is much higher than their contractual value. What's the reason for that? It's because they want to hang on to them. Okay? Uh, but as we'll see, that's not what the, uh, well, not, certainly not what the law countenances. Um, I'll put a little quote there from Terzio, um, and it's interesting because he says that, well, it can never actually be um, a truly liquidated damages clause. It was never pre agreed by both parties. Okay? There was no mutual agreement. Normally, it's the club saying, this is what you're worth. If anyone else wants you, that's how much you're paying. Okay, so it's almost like a standard form contract. The player gets very little say. I mentioned those examples before, uh, Ronaldo's and Messi's, they're quite staggering sums. Um, so what would happen if one of them wanted to leave? And there's been suggestions recently in the um, British press in particular, which takes a, an extreme liking to, uh, to what's happening in Spain because there's rumors that Messi may well be on his way to England, Chelsea of all clubs. <laughs> Just good news for some in the room. Um, so what happens then if Lionel Messi or Ronaldo decide that they want to terminate? Then we have to justify what the other club is paying for them. So how have they been valued here? Where have we pulled this sum from? Now they've both got incredibly large sponsorship deals and endorsements going for them, fair enough. But again, adding all of that up, can you honestly say as a genuine pre-estimate that Ronaldo is worth 785 million British pounds, one, one billion euro. I'm not sure you can. There's companies which are worth much less than that. Um, so 
as I've said there, presumably it covers, you know, the wages, the fees that Real Madrid or Barcelona would incur. So where are we pulling this figure from? And that leads me to ask, well, if that's not a genuine pre-estimate, and I'm really not sure it can be, then is that not a penalty clause? Because remember, penalties say if it's not a genuine pre-estimate, it's not enforceable. So what are the consequences of that? Well, they're quite significant, but because it would mean that literally close to 80% of all football player contracts, are for, in terms of um, buyout anyway, um, unenforceable. Those particular provisions are unenforceable. So I could go and offer, you know, $2,000, and if Messi's keen, he can come over and join my club. I'd be more than happy. I'd probably pay it. And that, I think, touches on um, issues of integrity as well. And that's because the buyout clause not only is questionable in terms of where it sits in our legal framework, but it also, um, thank you, it also raises some issues of integrity. And there's four principal reasons for this, which I'll get into now. First is, uh, we're over commercialising football. And how are we doing that? Well, from the late 19th century onwards, it's become a, more of a product, okay? It's so heavily commercialised that we're now talking about a business. It's, no, it's more than a sport now. It sounds like a cheap cliche from an 80s advert, I remember, but um, it's actually more of a business. And the issue with that is that if we're going to assign players with these extravagant values, okay, then what are we doing? You're actually indirectly resulting in inflation. Um, inflation of what is a, a self-organised market doesn't seem significant, but now we're talking about human beings worth billions of dollars. Um, and so that that's basically modelling football now as um, as a consumerism driven business. Okay, we're not talking about sport anymore. We're talking about products which are worth phenomenal sums. So there's one issue. A second, and this is the second of the four I want to tell you about, is it indirectly promotes competition monopoly. Now this one's a little um, contentious, but think about it this way. The bigger clubs, okay, your Real Madrid's, your Barcelona's, they can spend the money, they can buy these players, and then they can use the buyout clause all right, to hang on to them. How do they do this? Well, it's an unwritten convention in football that you know, the bigger clubs can offer the, you know, uh, the lesser clubs, for lack of a better term, good money, and then once they've got them, slap a ridiculous price tag on them. The third example I've put there is Neymar. He's a Brazilian starlet. Uh, Barcelona bought him from Santos, 42 million pounds, then straight away slapped 140 million pound buyout clause on him. Why? Because now he's close to untouchable. And so players become off limits. And this is, as I said, indirectly promoting competition monopoly. Now a lesser club could arguably do the same thing, but they're not going to go to Real Madrid and say we want 100 million pounds for this player, simply because of their status. Okay, in football culture it doesn't work that way. Third thing is, does it undermine contracts generally? Okay, and the principle of stability. Well, the common law says you don't have a right to terminate. Okay, you can't have a right to terminate. You're entitled to expect performance of that contract, pacta sunt servanda, right? Latin maxim. What does the buyout clause do? Well, it basically says, in a way, you do have that right. You know, you're not entitled to expect performance, which is at odds with the regulations elsewhere, which say, well, hang on you are expected to honour your contract as a player with your club. Bit contradictory. And so uh, there's, a, there's an argument which has been raised by some scholars, and this one I'm not entirely convinced, but I can see how you can get to this point, is that it will affect the balance of competition. Okay, Because if we're going to start destabilising contracts left, right and centre, some clubs will end up with a monopoly of sorts. And so the argument is that all of a sudden it's going to have larger scale implications for the industry. And the last thing is that it uh, arguably fosters play, player disloyalty. And I think this is a significant issue when we're talking about integrity. Okay, we're saying to a player, this is a clause which basically says, regardless of how long you're supposed to be playing for a club, you can buy out at any time if the price is right. Did that jingle go through anyone's head? That did for me. And so this has flow on psychological effects. Okay, what does that say to the players? It says, don't worry about being loyal. Okay, worry about your own career. Now the flip side argument, is there anything less ethical, um, or sorry, is it less ethical than to say to a player, well actually no, you should be looking out for yourself, this is your employment. And this was mentioned in the previous discussion. Okay, this is more than just a game now, this is what you do for a living. So is that any less ethical? I'm not sure, but it certainly sends a message, does it not? It says, it's okay. 
I'm not sure that we should be doing this. And it certainly raises issues of integrity anyway, not only for football, but for sport more broadly. So in conclusion, um, I think it's, it's a very complex question that we're asking because you know buyout clauses uh, by now are actually a very, very prominent feature in a lot of sporting contracts, more so for European football, association football. Um, but we're starting to see them now creep into NFL contracts, NBA, who knows, it might, there might even be some examples from the AFL. I couldn't tell you, but I know for a fact um, that these clauses, buyout clauses, are being used more and more. And the issue is, if they're not legal, they're certainly, um, in some respects at least, questionable in terms of ethics. Thank you.